So I want to begin a little bit south of the Shemaya to go through a little bit the story of the Garden of Eden and then the story with, with the snake to understand our responsibility and also to connect this a little bit with the month that we're in which is the month of Cheshvan The month of Cheshvan is connected according to the Sefi Yitzira, to the letter Nun. And there's two types of Nun. There's a Nun that's uh, <coughs> a regular Nun. And then there's a straight Nun. Nun generally in Hebrew stands for the word Nefila, for falling. That's why in the Ashray prayer there is no Nun. There's no verse that starts with Nun because it represents Nefila which represents falling, and also corresponds to Nachash, which is snake. But in the idea of falling, there's one nun that's falling, because the nun, the shape of the nun is like a bent over. And the final nun is when the nun is straightened out. And when the nun is straightened out, it represents someone that fell and stood up. And there's something also about the snake, that there's a snake that is connected to falling, and then... For example, it says in the Gemara, it says in the Talmud that when a person bows, when they pray the Maidim, they should bow, they should fall. But then when they get up, they should get up like a snake. Which means they're straightening their back like a, like a snake. That's an upright snake. That's the opposite of feel. So Maidim is you're falling, but then when you're getting up, the snake, the, the Nun becomes a straight a straight. So we have to understand a little bit before we understand what the snake is, we have to understand what the story of the Garden of Eden is. And to do something very simple, before we get into the very deep things, we just have to read the Pesach and basically read the verses and see what the verses say to understand, to understand a little bit what's going on. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to read is the creation of the human being in, in chapter 2. Verse Tezayin and Yudzayin, 16 and 17, and I have it here in, in the English. So, Vayitzav Hashem Alekim Esa Allah Adam Leymar, Mekol Eitz Agan Achal Teachal, that Hashem Alekim commanded man, saying, Every tree of the garden you shall eat, Umeitz Adas Tevra, Lo Yisaychal, but from the tree of knowledge you shall not eat, Kibiyah B'chalchal Menom Lo Yistumos, because the day that you're going to eat from it, you're going to die. So let's read these verses again. Hashem Elohim tells man, Adam, Mikola eats hagan achal te'achal. From all the fruits, from all the trees of the garden, you shall eat. When that means that you shall eat from all the fruits, means you can eat everything. That's what it's saying. You shall, and not only you could, but you should. You should eat from everything. But don't eat from the tree of knowledge, good and evil. But you just said we should eat from all, all the fruits. Another problem, or an issue that has to be understood, is are we talking about a specific tree? Is there somehow, in the Garden of Eden, there is one tree that's called the tree of life. One tree is called the tree of knowledge. And Hashem says, don't eat from the tree of knowledge because the day you eat from the tree of knowledge, you're going to die. Is that what happened? Because it's very unclear what these trees are. How many trees are there? There's 50 trees, and there's one tree called the tree of life, and one tree is called the tree of knowledge. And certainly we understand this on our own personal level, that there's something about eating from the tree of knowledge, that because of that, we enter into the world of duality, of opposites. And when we're connected to the tree of life, we are connected to life. So maybe, in fact, we're not actually talking about two separate trees, but rather talking about the same reality, and we're talking about two perspectives of the same thing. Mikola eats agan achal teachal from all the trees you shall eat means you shall eat from everything, because everything has a tree of life. Um eats adas toiverab from the tree of knowledge you shall not eat. Don't eat from a specific thing, because the moment you eat from a specific thing, 
then you're eating knowledge versus life. You can eat everything, but the moment you separate something from the everything, that is the tree of knowledge. In other words, the tree of knowledge is not a separate tree. It's every tree in itself, which means every reality. Eights is just a metaphor. Tree is just a metaphor for life. Every, every reality in life has both the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. When you eat, Mikola eats again, if you eat from all the trees, if you eat from everything, everything by definition means everything, so then it's connected to everything, that's the tree of life. But the moment you make a distinction, you say, I would like this particular thing, that's already going to be eating from the tree of knowledge, and that's going to be the root of, of idol worship. Because what is, the, what is the depth of idol worship? Idol worship is not that you're worshiping one thing, but you're worshiping... Not that you're worshipping a particular thing, but you're worshipping one thing over the everything. Because everything really is part of Hashem. But the moment you say, I'm, doing, I'm, I'm connecting to one thing, that's already the tree of knowledge. So let's just think about this for, for a second, and we'll move a little further. But this is the first thing we have to understand. That there is something about the Garden of Eden, and the Garden of Eden has two realities. These two realities is not only something that happens in our past, this is something primordial, but it means also in our own life. There's something in our own life that's connected to the tree of life, and the tree of life means connected to something that's immortal and something that's perfect. And there's something, when we make certain choices, that connects us to the tree of knowledge, which is the tree of separation. So one is unity and one is separation, and we actually are making continuously choices whether we're still in the Garden of Eden with the tree of life, or we ate, or we eat from the tree of knowledge. Now, the basic difference between these two these two realities is that the tree of life is one, the tree of duality, the tree of knowledge is dual, is dual, and it's rooted in in knowledge, because knowledge, the moment I understand something, and I give it a quality, and I say this thing is good, by definition, if I say one thing is good, that means the other thing is bad. If I say one thing is bad, by definition, it means something else is good. In the tree of life, there's no distinction between good and bad. So the question, the, the, the real question, or another question is, are we not supposed to make distinctions? Are we supposed to live in the tree of life and not make distinctions from the tree of, the tree of duality? In other words, is the human being supposed to be someone that has no knowledge, that has no das? This is actually the first question that was asked that Maimonides deals with in the Garden of Perplex is this exact same question, which is, what happens if we didn't eat from the tree of knowledge? So we wouldn't have knowledge? Is that what, is that what we're supposed to aspire for? Now the Arizal, the Ari, gives us a clue to understand a little of the story by saying it's premature. That we were supposed to eat from the tree of knowledge that was part of the part of our development is we're going to eat from the tree of knowledge and we should be eating from the tree of knowledge but the story of Adam and Chava in the Garden of Eden was that they ate from the tree of knowledge too early instead of waiting for Shabbos they were created on Friday instead of waiting for Shabbos to eat from the tree of knowledge they ate it prematurely so somehow we are supposed to eat from the tree of knowledge but we're supposed to do it in a, st in a stage not in that not in the beginning. We have to understand what that means. So let's go back to the creation of man, which is in chapter 1. You have this in the papers over here. In chapter 1, verse 26. So if you're familiar a little bit, it's the story repeats itself twice. The story of creation of Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, repeats itself twice. Once in chapter 1 and once in chapter 2. In chapter 1, Pasuk Chavav. Vayomer Elikim, Elikim says, Nasa Adam et Salmeinu kid Museinu, V'yirdu b'digas ayam, U'ba'oif ha-shamayim, U'ba'hevu chal aretz, Ala remers, Aramis Allah arts. And people let us make man in our image after our likeness, and they shall redo over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the heaven, over the animals, and all over the earth, and all the creeping things that crept upon the earth. Now, 
The verse says, Nasa Adam, who was created from this, from this utterance? When it says, let us create man, who was created? Adam. Right? So Adam was created. But like we learn in verse 27, Zachar ben Akeva bar a male and female, he created them, which means that when we talk about Adam, we're not actually talking about a male. Because like the verse says, Betzalmenu means in our image, which is Zachar ben Akeva, male and female, he created them. So let's just think about this, because until the second story, Adam refers to both Adam and Chava as one, male and female as one. So the verse starts off, Nasa Adam Betzalmenu, let us create man, which is not man. It's the human being, right? Because it's man and woman, Adam. Nasa Adam Betzalmenu Kinnumuseinu, let's create man in our image and in our likeliness. Who's the our? Bitsalmenu kidmuseinu, in our likelihood and our image. Who's the likelihood of who? Why is there a plural? God is speaking, Elohim is speaking, and says, Nas Adam Kitsalmenu Kidmuseinu. So Hashem is talking, God is talking, and saying, Let us create man in our image. So what's the our image? So there are different sources that speak about the angels created also from the beasts. But on a very deep level, Nas Adam and Kitsal means let us create man, means let the totality of creation participate in the creation of the human being. This is very important to understand. That what does it mean, Nas Adam and Let us create in our image. Elohim is speaking to everything that Elohim created up until this point. So the human being is not just the highest predator that was created. So first you have vegetation, or let's say, let's say on day five you have vegetation, vegetation, then on day six you have the animal kingdom, and then on day, on day five you have four, and then day five you have the animal kingdom, then day six you have the creation of the human being. This creation of the human being is not just a higher form in terms of the sequence that was created, but this being, this being is a creation from everything. So let's say the zebra is created on, on day five. Right? However we understand this. So the zebra is created. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a very specific creation that was created on, on, on that day. When it speaks about the creation of a human being, who is participating with the creation of a human being? Everything. So who is the human being? The human being is actually everything. Everything becomes reflected and included within the human being. So Nas Adam et Salmeinu, let us create, us create in our image, means in the image of the everything, this human being will be created in. So therefore, who is the human being? The human being is part sun, part moon, part animal, part vegetation. So therefore, it's not just that the human being is the highest predator, but the human being is actually includes everything. So who is responsible for everything? Because who, is, who actually includes everything? The zebra is responsible for the zebra life. The lion is responsible for the lion. The ocean is responsible for the ocean. And there's some type of a sar, there's some type of a spiritual angel that's connected. There's, there's a sar of the harem, and there's a sar of the mayim. Who's responsible for everything? The human being. Who's connected to the everything? The human being. Because the human being is actually part of everything. And that's what's going to be the next story. That's the next story of the Torah, which actually happens, is that we see the whole story of Noach. So what's, what's the story of Noach and the Great Flood? That the human being is corrupted. Because the human is corrupted, everything is corrupted. It's not just the human beings are corrupted, it's like the zebras are you know, doing their corrupted thing. Okay, but it's not really affecting the whole universe. Here we're saying the humans are, are, are corrupted, and they're corrupting the whole manifest reality. Everything becomes corrupted. The ocean is not functioning correctly and the zebras are not functioning correctly. Everything is reflected because a human being is actually not just on the top, the highest predator, the most powerful, but the human being actually includes everything. Therefore, the way the human is going to, 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 to develop is going to affect everything in creation. This is B'Tzalmeinu B'Kidus Kid Musayin. Now, this creation of this, this human being, this being, is told, Nasa Adam Tzalmeinu Kedmuseinu, V'yirdu v'digas hayamu v'ovez shamayim, 
which most people translate as to have dominion over, over the fish and the birds. But the, the root of the word viyirdu means to lower themselves. The root is the word raid. Why is everyone sitting so back? You can, everyone can move forward and doesn't have to, I don't have to scream. There's the, the idea of raid. Raid means that, you could, that he lowers himself. He lowers himself to everything, to the bird and to the fowl and, to, and to, the, to the fish. Why is he lowering himself to fish? Because he's partly fish. The reason why he's responsible for the fish in the ocean because he is a fish. And the reason why he's responsible for the birds because he is a bird. You're following? This is very important in terms of what, what, what is the person's responsibility. And therefore, when it says that this creation, this human being... It says Rudu again, Rudu Bidiga Siam Wai Fishabai, Mikhol is an Asas. And then in verse twenty nine, Hina the Satlachem call Ace of Zera Zerel Shah Khol Ace of Arts, Khol Ace of Shapriya. I have this in the translation of here, instead of giving you every seed bearing herb which is upon the surface of the earth, and every tree that has a bearing fruit should be used for fruit. So what could you eat? What could a human being eat? They can eat vegetation. This is the this is the human being. What happens after the flood? After the story of the flood, the human being is permitted to start eating meat. And we're going to see that's actually a descent, because now the human is, is showing that they're no longer responsible, or they cannot take full responsibility for everything, because look what happened when they did. And because of that, he just becomes another predator, and predators eat what is lower than them. But we're, we're going ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to the story of the creation of Adam. So there's one creation of Adam, which means the creation of everything, and therefore the human is connected to everything, and is part of everything, and therefore is responsible for everything. This is the human being, Adam, and it doesn't mean Adam, it means Adam Chava, in their primal state, in the highest place that they could be. Then there's another story, which seems to be a repeat, but it's a completely different story, and the story is in chapter 2. The story in chapter 2 is that um, that this is what it says. Vayikar Adam Shem is Man is created. First, it's not good for man to be alone. Let's create an Azer Konegda, a helper against him. Are you familiar with this verse? Then it says, Hashem Elohim puts man into a great slumber. We have this also in English in translation. He falls asleep. He takes one of his sides and he, he places flesh. He places and he calls the flesh in his place. And this and the person says, This time it is bone for my bone, flesh my flesh. This one should be called Isha because this is from the Ish. This is verse 21 22. So what happens here? Adam was already created. Adam was already created. Adam is created with Chava. So what does it mean? It's not good for man to be alone, but he's not alone. And in fact, it's not a he. Right? We just said that Zachar and Akeva Boris and he created male and female, which means it's both a male and a female. And now in the verse, in the second chapter, it's like a new story. It's not good for man to be alone. We're going to have to create a wife for him. A, man is not alone. And B, why are you calling him man? He's not man. So the first thing to understand is that the word Adam doesn't mean man. Eventually, it's going to mean also the man Adam. But Adam means human. So it's not good for the human to be alone. But the human is not alone. He has Chava. We just said Zachar and Baris, and we created them together. So the depth of what this means is that the relationship between Adam and Chava in chapter number one is going to, and the relationship between Adam and Chava in chapter number two is going to parallel the same idea of the tree of life versus the tree of knowledge. And it's going to be related to the snake. We'll see how that moves. There is something, we said the tree of life, we said is the tree of unity, the tree of one. 
And the depth of that, which comes from Tzadik and other big Tzadikim, the depth of this is that there's actually no two separate trees. Every tree, every reality has both the possibility of the tree of life and the possibility of the tree of knowledge. I'll give you a very, very simple example, and, this is, and it's very important to understand this. That it's the difference between a child relating to something and an adult relating to something. Take a little kid, and their, rela- their, their relationship with something, they don't understand what they have, they don't understand what, that this is something that they're given, something that other kids don't have, and they take it for granted. And there's no discerning, there's no, there's no knowledge, there's no awareness. Take an adult that has something in their life, so they appreciate it, and they understand that not everyone has it, and I have it, and another person doesn't have it, and other people have less, other people have more. So there's a quality of making distinctions. This is better for me, this is worse for another person. This is already an adult interaction with life. So das, awareness, is something that comes with maturity, right? When the more you mature, become, the more mature you become, the more you're relating to things through the paradigm, through a prism of das, of awareness. And awareness already means distinction. A little kid doesn't know that there's other realities. This is the reality that they're born into. This is, this is perfect for them. Until they grow up and they start becoming aware. And they say, wait a second, why, did, why do I have this? And other kids have that. And this other kids have this. And I don't have that. But that's a later stage of awareness. Adam and Chava, as they're created in the first story, when it says, Zachar and Akeva bar some male and female, he created them, they're one. What does it mean that they're one? There's no sense of separation. There's no sense of separation of anything. They're in the tree of life. And in the tree of life, there's no sense of separation, period. So this is why a lot of the Madrashic images of that their, their body is transparent or their hands are attached, it's all the same idea is that there's no separation. They have no separation. They don't experience any form of separation. The second story is where Adam and Chava are becoming separated. What does it mean that they're becoming separated? Which we talked about many times is that they're going to have an encounter which is panam al panam, face to face. So before they have a relationship which is called achar ba achar, back to back. Back to back means like this, wherever one moves, the other one moves. Face to face means they're standing against each other. Against each other means they could encounter each other, or one can move this way and one can move the other way, and they can separate. But when you're having a genuine encounter, it's part of a part of it's face to face. In order to create the face to face relationship, Adam is going to have to evolve, and this is what the Torah is going to explain in chapter 2. Up until this point, Adam is one, Adam and Chavar are one. What happens in chapter 2? To Adam, there was no one, there was no corresponding against him. There needed to be an other. In order to have a proper relationship, there needed to be an other. How does the other come about? And this is what the Torah is going to describe. How did the first other come into creation? The original other. Voracious bar lekim as Hashemayim as arts. Right? The beginning God created the heavens and earth, or before the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and, th- and then there was the creation. How was man created? Bitsalmanikin Luseno. So, what's the root of the word Salmanikin Luseno? Tsel. Salmenu is Tsel. And Dmutsenu is Dmut. So, image and reflection, or um, shadow, likeness. So let's use the word like the the, the image and the, and the and the likeness of the shadow. So when Hashem is creating, when God is creating, Hashem is creating through. Let's let's just think about the way we create, and then we'll try to superimpose this. When we create something, how do we create something? First, we have to think it, dream it, then speak it, or actually make it, and then it's created. But in order for something to happen, you first have to think about it. Right? So if creation first occurs in your thoughts, or in your imagination, or in your dream, 
right? And then it becomes manifest in your reality. Anything that you want in your life. Or else things that just come to you, but this is probably subconscious urges or wishes. But if you want something in your life, you want to do something. First, you have to have a passion, a desire, a dream to create it, and then it's created. So let's try to imagine this with God. Of course, we have to understand this on multiple, multiple, multiple levels, higher and higher and higher. But on one level, let's call, let's say, from the world of Atsilas, how has creation occurred? It's in the Machshav, it's in thought. What does that mean? That this first, a dream, an idea, that there should be a creation, which is the first inner movement within Atsilas, within the unity of one, And then from there begins a process of creation. First has to be the desire. There's a, an image that comes from the Emer Kamelach in the students of the of the Arizal. There's Reb Chaim Vital school, and then then Yisrael Sarug. So most Kabbalah that we have comes from Chaim Vital. But Rizal Sarug was another student of the, of the Arizal, and Rizal Sarug's Kabbalah went to, went to Italy. And all the Italian Kabbalahs were, 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 were stronger into Rizal Sarug. That's not obviously the Ashkenazic, general Lithuanian or Russian, Polish Kabbalah, but that, that was the Italians. One of the, one of the, one of the Kabbalahs is a, that uh, we find the teaching that is not found in Ruchai Vital is a conversation about the, the Tzimtzum before the Tzimtzum. Everyone knows it's a Tzimtzum. There's a contraction of the infinite light to create. This is a contraction of the circle. If you ever saw the image, right, there's a, there's a, there's a contraction of the circle and a line that's drawn in this. You ever saw this, this image? This is the famous Ruchai Vital's paradigm. But then there's a higher, a higher paradigm which is called the Tzimtzum of Merubah, the, the Tzimtzum of the, of the square. Which is something that's not found in the teachings of, of Rukhaim Vital, but it's found only in Rusal Sarug. So that it goes even higher and higher and higher. For some reason, Rukhaim Vital didn't choose, didn't choose to write about it. But what's the origin, origin of all creation? So there's a very sweet image that comes from Naim HaKamelech, and he says it's Shashu HaMelech. It comes from the pleasure of the king, like a joke. So imagine, this is, try to imagine this, yeah? Imagine God. <coughs> is one. Okay, so imagine I'm standing here. I'm, I'm very one. So there's no movie. You don't see fingernails. You don't see ears. Anything is just one. It's one. One flat screen. Right? And then someone tells you a joke. So what happens when a person jokes? There's a ripple. Right? Your body actually physically ripples. You like you when you're laughing. Right? So that creates, that first ripple is the first movement in the Ein Sof to create another. So when there's a ripple, there's, a, there's an opening, right? This thing is flat, and all of a sudden the person laughs and creates that space. So the whole world cre was created in that joke. You're following? Mm -hmm. Once there was the joke, that created the space, and that's, that, that allowed for creation. What was the ultimate joke? The ultimate joke was us, obviously. That the Ein Sof saw us, and had a chuckle, and because of that, they, were, they removed space, and that allowed for the whole creation. But the point is, there has to be some type of image. You have, to, you have to have some type of idea, some type of dream. So in creation of Adam, it talks about Kitzal Menuk and Musenu, which is in the Dimyon, right? Musenu comes from the word Dimyon. Dimyon means imagination. Tzel is like the shadow. It's like some, in the imagination of, 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 of Lukim, Man was created, an imagination of everything. Now, in this creation, Adam and Chava are still one. Now Adam and Chava have to start separating. How does Adam and Chava separating? Where each one creates the other in their own imagination. Because like we said, in order for you to create something, you actually have to create it first in your imagination, in your thought. So to create the space to have a relationship with someone that you had a relationship all your life because it's back to back. It's always there. But now you want to have a new type of relationship with them. Or you want to have a new relationship period with somebody. First you have to have the desire to have the relationship with the other person. And you have to think, that would be very interesting and wonderful if I had a relationship with this person. Or if I had a relationship period. 
Right? You have to first open yourself up. Once you open yourself up, then you allow yourself for that possibility. So when it talks about the creation of, of in the second story, chapter 2, it doesn't say that Adam was one, and Adam, again, we say is Adam and Chava. It doesn't say, Hashem said, Adam and Chava, now you're two. It doesn't say that. It says, a whole process, Hashem put a sleep, a slumber on that. man. And he slept. And he, and, he, and he slept. And he took one of his sides. Why this whole elaborate narrative? Let us just say, Hashem says, you're, it's not good for man to be alone, which means you're back to back. You're split now. Now you're two. Because what Hashem wants is that we should participate in our creation. We should be co creators in our own narrative, in our own story. How do we become co-creators and narratives and co-creators in our own narrative? Is when we start creating in the same way Hashem created. Just like Hashem created in B'tzalmenu Kid Musenu, which we said is like in the likeness and the image and in the dream, the same root words are found in this verse, the man goes to sleep. Man is not man. Who's man? Man is man and woman. It's other machava. Right? Tardema has the same words. Tardema means a slumber, but it has the same words as dimyon, has the same root letters, which is dal mem, which means dumustenu, like dimyon from imagination. He took one of his sides. What's the root word of his side? Sel, which is the same thing like tzalmenu. Which is, the, which is the image, or the likeliness. So just like Hashem creates us in His imagination, as it were, we created the other in our own imagination. So who created Chava? Adam. Who created Adam? Chava. Right? Each one created the other one in their dream, in their imagination. And then, then it became real, it became flesh. Okay, so this is the process that we're 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 completing creation because this is we're mimicking the creator's process of creation. We also create the same way. And therefore he says, Vayamar Adam, now Adam here means the man, but of course the woman had the same opinion, says, Zoisapam this time etzematsa, my bone for my bone, flesh for my flesh. This person is, right? Therefore, man shall leave his, his father and mother and cleave to his, to his, to his wife and, and be like one flesh. What does it mean this time? This time, it's bone from bone and flesh from flesh. What does this, this time mean? This time and which, and which time not? So, why wasn't the first time not? The first time was what? No, but it doesn't say it. It says, Zoisapam, etzematzamai, it's flesh from my flesh. The first story, it's also flesh from my flesh. But what's the difference? So what does that mean? No, but I'm, I understand that. But Zoisapam, when they say Zoisapam, this time, this time I'm going to have a relationship, he says that this time I'm going to have a relationship unlike the previous times, because this time it's actually flesh from my flesh and, and, and bone from my bone. Ah, so that's one interpretation. That's shot. And one interpretation was that it's in contrast to what happened previously with the animals. That before it was not etzimat samai, and now it's etzimat samai. Before it was not flesh my flesh and bone for my bone, now it was. Now, this interpretation is said in the Medrash. We can say that what the Medrash is saying is something also, and it's going to be the same interpretation. When he says this time and the animals were different, it actually this, this time... But before, I was like an animal. Before my relationship with, like, with Chava was in the animal kingdom. Or, or different. But there's something also very interesting that, I don't know if you ever heard of this concept of uh, Lilith. So, there's a very strange, um, strange character that a lot of people have uh, misconceptions of what this what this person is or this being is. But there's a, there's a concept that's med- mentioned in Medrash and the Zaire, which is called Lilith. And uh, there's a lot of horrible things told about Lilith. 
So the first story, as everyone says, Lilith is the first wife of Adam. Did you hear this? The, the first wife of Adam was a son that was called Lilith, and she rebelled. And since then, she, uh, we have to understand who she is, but let's just talk literal, that this she is responsible for, God forbid, for the death of, of, of infants and childbirth. And that's why Hashem uh, Ishmar. This is what uh, this is the reason why people put little cards when a, when one gives has, gives has birth, has a baby. So the custom is you hang these little signs, these little uh, passages of, of psalms, and there's some things from uh, from Raziel Amalach, and there's some images of, of chickens, and some names of different angels, and it's basically a shmira, a protection against Lilith. So what are you protecting yourself against Lilith? There's also this idea of um, that's also mentioned a lot in the Zohar and in Kabbalistic text that uh, Lilith is this demonic figure that's responsible for like male emissions at night. So what, what is what is really what's, what's what's this Lilith business? What is actually what does this really mean? We have to understand, first of all, very important, that whenever we're talking about uh, demons or shadim or any type of negative forces, they're not real in the same way something's real. It's not real like a table's real. Um, it's a state of consciousness that is either related to you in your state of consciousness, and therefore you have a demonic shade consciousness, or it's a collective consciousness. But it's not an actual physical thing. What is the concept of Lilith? What is the idea of Lilith? That Lilith is... There's some commentators that say that when Adam says, Zois Apam, this time, it's going to be etzim atzamai, flesh for my flesh, and uh, bone for my bone, and flesh for my flesh. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This time, in contrast to the previous time when I was with Lilith. But he wasn't really with Lilith because he was actually with Chava, and Adam and Chava were the same person. The concept of, of, of Lilith, and we'll see that this is why it's connected also with the snake. The concept of Lilith and the concept of, 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 of Klippa in general, of negative, of, neg- of these negative forces is specifically connected to imagination, fantasy, specifically connected to fantasy and imagination in terms of physical, intimate ideas. And the idea of the fantasy is that um, that one person is just an extension of the other and there's no responsibility for your action. That's, that's the basic idea. So whenever it talks about, let's say we'll start with um, a very extreme example. <coughs> when it says that after a mother gives, has a baby, you protect the mother from Lilith. What does it mean that you're protecting the mother from Lilith? Lilith is not actually an external force that's going to come, God forbid, and attack the baby. What this means is from the, 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 the consciousness of, and this is certainly true years ago, of a person having a child and maybe not wanting the child. Not 100% wanting the child. Um, maybe they married young. Maybe, God forbid, it's another situation. And there was no choice. And they had the child. And there's something that's called postpartum depression, which some women suffer anyways. And the Gemara speaks about this, that a woman after she has birth says, I'm never going to have another child again. But we're not even talking about that. We're just talking about this idea that, that just because I did a certain action doesn't mean that I have a whole responsibility for a person's life. Okay, just because a person had a taiva, a certain had a desire, so because of that desire, for the next 70 years, you're responsible for this person's life. But that means that this consequence, the more powerful the thing it is, the more consequence it is. You do something that has a little bit value, so the consequence is a little bit. 
You do something that has a lot of power, and something that has extreme divine powers because it's like it's a creative power. It's it's the power to recreate, which is the ultimate divine power that we have. It's the koyach the, the the infinite power that we can perpetuate our species inf- infinitely. This power is the highest power in the human being. If we use it in a, in a, an incorrect way, so then the the consequence. I don't want to say this in consequence. I don't want to sound like it's a terrible thing. God forbid. It's the nicest thing in the world to have children. But I'm saying there is an effect of what you've done. Things have. Now, what is the idea of Lilith? This is what the rebellion of Lilith. We're not actually talking about a rebellion of a physical person, but the rebellion of the concept of Lilith, or the idea of taking away, God forbid, a child and protecting a child, is all this idea is like, so what? Just because I did something, it doesn't mean that I'm responsible for this person forever. That's a klipa, of course, because you don't want to live with that responsibility. So to protect yourself from Lilith means to protect yourself from that consciousness of saying that I just want to have pleasure without any responsibility, or I want to do certain things and I don't have responsibility for it. This is the depth of what, of what the people live. This is why any types of physical, bodily expressions related to intimacy that is done in an improper way or done in a way that there's no consequence, like a, a male nightly emission, for example, that is all connected with Lilith. Now that's that's the clip of the fantasy. So what is the fantasy? The fantasy is so what? I, I just do it because because I have I have a pleasure. Now, when it says in the in the verse, Zoisapam this time, etzematzamai, flesh bone for my bone, flesh for my flesh. What he's saying is that this time and not previously, because previously Adam was in Chava's mind, and Chava was only in Adam's mind. Because they were one. And the beginning, the, the, the moment they started separating, they were still in their own, in the, fan, in the dream, right? Vayapal Hashem Tardema, Hashem made them a Tardema, which means they fell into a slumber. And each one dreamed of the other. So where was Chava? Chava was in Adam's mind. Where was Adam? Adam was in Chava's mind. What was Chava to Adam? Just an extension of Adam. What was Adam to Chava? Just an extension of Chava. You're following? Because it was back to back. So back to back means that one person is just an extension of the other person. And you're only there to fulfill my dreams. You're not actually... There's there's no Etzim Matzame. There's no flesh and bones. What are you there for? Because I have a desire and you're there to fulfill my desire. And the Torah says that from now on, you have to realize that Zaysapam, that from now forward, it's not going to be this way, but there's going to be this consequence. Because it's not just in the imagination, it's not just in the world of fantasy, it's actually a real person. So if you do something to a real person, it affects the person really, and therefore you have to take responsibility, responsibility really. You can't say, okay, my, this person was just filling in the fantasy of my, of my story. I just used this person because whatever. And uh, whatever, let the person go on their own way. I don't really care about them. That's, that is Klippa. That is Lilith. Right? And this, this, to say that now, no, it's etzem matzam, I'm sorry. It's, it's flesh my flesh and bone for my bone. Now let's go see how this works in terms of the story of the snake. What happens in the story of the snake? So, the Pasuk tells us, Hashem tells us, You can eat from every tree, just don't eat from the tree of knowledge. The moment you're going to eat from the tree of knowledge, you're going to die. Why is Thomas? Incidentally, they didn't die the moment they ate from the tree, right? So, you can say, Moist Thomas, you will, you will enter into, into a concept that the death will, you can, you're going to experience death. The death will be a reality. Or we once mentioned that Arizal talks about how every time you eat, you're actually dying. I'm sorry, not every time you eat. Every time you release what you eat, there's a little bit dying. 
You're actually releasing toxins. And you're actually releasing, you're dying a little part of yourself that's dying. That process of, of this relieving oneself and going to the bathroom is essentially a death, a death practice because you're actually shedding stuff, shedding cells. And if they would have been in the tree of life without the tree of knowledge, they wouldn't have to do that. Where do we see this? We see this an image in, in, in the 40 years of the desert where it says that they ate the man and because the, the man is, is similar to the tree of life, they actually, that's why they also didn't have to prepare and didn't have to do all the things because it was already perfection. Therefore, they also didn't have to go through this process of Mice Thomas. But let's go into the story. The story is like this. Hashem Lekim tells us about them, call Eitzagan, Eichotach, you should eat from all the trees, which means you can eat from everything. Don't eat from a specific thing. The moment you can eat from a, sp- a specific thing, what's going to happen? There's going to be a consequence. Now, like we said before, Darizal says, and this is the best way, the only way to read this, these verses, it was never intended that we shouldn't have knowledge. It was never intelligent to, to, for us to be idiots in the Garden of Eden, to have just, uh, you know, we're in the tree of life and everything's fine, I'm like a little kid in a candy store. The whole idea was that we should be intelligent people and have das and have awareness and make, have free choice and make decisions, say this is good for me, this is bad for me, this is good for someone, this is bad for someone, right? We have to continuously make those choices. But those choices had to come in a later stage in our development, which Darizal said would have been Shabbos. So imagine... Just to do this very quickly, it's like saying the tree of knowledge had to be eaten or had to be internalized in the reality of Shabbos, which is the tree of life. So you have to internalize knowledge within the context of life, not as separate from life. Not there's a tree of life, and then they're making a choice for the tree of knowledge, but we would wait for Shabbos. Shabbos is the tree of life reality, and in Shabbos reality, we would have eaten from the tree of knowledge. That would have been the best case scenario. And we'll see soon practically what this actually means because it actually has very practical relevance because ultimately we're actually trying to get back into the Garden of Eden or to be in that perfect state. And what does it actually mean? How do we get back into the Garden? Back into the verses. Bikola eats, you shall eat from all the trees, just don't eat from this particular tree. The moment you eat from the tree, there's going to be a consequence. And you have to take responsibility. Correct? What happens? The Nachash in chapter 3 appears. In verse 1. Va Nachash Aram. I think we probably have it here. Yeah. And the snake was Aram. On the second page. The snake was Aram. Literally, the Aram means sly, a sneakiness. That the Nachash, the snake was Aram. So, what does Aram is? So the Sephorn and others write that Aram is Hamachtia Yasaze Bemtsoyz Koycham Adama in Dimyoni Atanugam Avilma Simtsoyim Lekoychaz Agashvim that is connected to the Oilam, the world of demon and imagination and fantasy. That what is the snake? This is the downfall. This is why the 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 the, the nun of the of Nachash represents the fila, which is downfall. The downfall of the human being is when we listen to a voice and the voice is always external. It's not our internal voice. That's, the, that's what the Torah is saying, right? That the Nachash is talking. It's not the person himself. There's some external voice. Someone tells you, by the way, you're a very responsible person. You take responsibility for your life, but you should know that this is not such a big deal. Eh, it's not such a big deal. What does the Nachash say? Afke Amor Lekim even though it says that you're not going to eat, lay moist to Muslim, you're not going to die. Verse 4. Hashem says there's going to be a consequence. You're going to die. If you eat from the tree of knowledge, the says, what are you talking about? There's no, there's no consequence. And, sh- and, 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 and the tree is savahu le'nayim. It's, it's a lot of pleasure. It's pleasure to the eyes. The nechba the eats lehaskil and sees that it has a lot of wisdom. There's a lot of beauty and wisdom, a lot of desire. And the Nachash says, there is no consequence. Nothing's going to happen. Don't worry. What's that? That's the klipa. That's the same klipa that we talk about. The nachash klipa. The snake klipa. We'll have to talk, if we have God willing time, how we can actually transform nachash into mashiach. Because nachash and mashiach have the same numeric value. And the, the falling nun becomes the up, the, 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 the nun that's, that's standing up. And if the nun that's standing up 
is when the nachash is redeemed. It's like the transformation of the nachash, of the snake, is when it's standing up. Like we said, moidim, right? Moidim is, is, is bowing. And it says, first of all, the numeric value of moidim is actually 100. So it's 50 for each, each nun. So the bowing nun, which is one, and the up nun. But you don't bow like a nachash. You're not supposed to bow like a snake. It's actually very not Jewish, and you shouldn't do it. Um, you have to bow down, which means that you're bringing energy from the mo- from the moach to your side, and not the other way around. You bring it from intelligence to the lower part of the body, not the other direction. When you do that, and you create that circuitry, then you can lift your head and you lift it up like a snake, and you have the perfect hundred, and that's a straightened out snake. That's the transformation of negative fantasy into something that's positive. And it says that uh, if you don't bow down. Um, in Maidim, this is the sages of the Talmud say this, if you go down in Maidim, somehow your, your, your spine turns into a snake. So this is all connected, because if you don't have humility. <laughs> but what is the, 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 the opposite of that? The opposite of that is like there's, there's, no, there's no responsibility. You can do whatever you want, because every single thing and every single person and every single reality is just an extension of your own fantasy. You're completely wrapped in your own mind, and who cares? I can do whatever I want. It's, it's, it's pleasurable to me. This is the Nachash reality. But the whole concept of eating from the tree of knowledge was to become responsible beings, right? That's what Hashem told us. That's what God told us. That the moment you're going to eat from the tree of knowledge, that's when you're going to have consequence. Up until the point, there was no consequence in the tree of, in the Garden of Eden. There was no consequence. Love the Shabbos. Just do work. It doesn't say there's a consequence if you don't do it. This is the first time the consequence is. Because consequence comes from knowledge. Knowledge comes from duality. They eat from the tree is everyone following, more or less? <laughs> they eat from the tree of knowledge. And what happens? What happens? So Hashem comes over to them and says, Did you eat from the tree of knowledge? This is what the question that Hashem poses them. And this is like the inner, deeper voice. So the Nachash is the external voice. The inner voice says, Did you do this? And what do you, what's your response? What's your response? It's not only Adam's response. It's every person's response. When the higher voice tells you what do you do, what do you listen to your lower voice, what do you say? The other person talked me in. It's not my fault. What do you say? You gave me the wife. You, it's your fault. It's not my fault. It's certainly not her fault. But it's not, definitely not my fault. Maybe her fault or your fault, but not my fault. Right? So then Hashem turns to... To the, to the woman, what does she say? Snake. snake. The, the, the snake talked me in. Which is the Ani also has the word Yeshani, which I, I am, which is that the, the, the Nachash is the, the, the ego. And it says it's a snake. So what happens? Instead of taking responsibility, it actually happens the opposite. They eat from the tree of knowledge. They try to live like the Nachash with no responsibility. And they, sh- they, they take responsibility. They say, if it's me, no, it's the other person. The other person, no, it's the other person. Everyone's blaming the other person. So now there's a very interesting thing that happens. Which is in verse Tezayin. We're trying to give you a very broad overview of what this idea is. So you tell me when there's a cutoff and we'll do it. Sure. So Isha Omar, Hashem says there's, there's a curse. There's a, there's a curse. And the curse is, Harba Arba You're going to have a lot of Itzavan. This is what Hashem tells the woman. You're going to have a lot of Itzavan. And the root word of Itzavan is Eitzav. Eitzav is a word, a modern word like Atzavan, like depression. Ula Adam Amar, Kishamat Lakalishnach, Tamil Eitz. With a lot of itzavan, you will plant your seed. <coughs> so, the woman is cursed, and I, 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 this is a very harsh word, but we have to look at it more <coughs> as consequence, because that's what the Torah is, right? It's a, it's a cause and effect. This is what you put into motion. This is the effect that's going to happen. What happens? The woman receives itzavan, and the man receives itzavan. So everyone's familiar, the woman has, has hardship and childbirth. But the word itzavan, if you look very closely in the verse, it says, Also with etzav you're going to give birth. But there's harba abar there's something else. You can have a lot of itzavan. 
And the man, he's going to plant his, his, his garden, his, his farm, and he's going to have a lot of Yitzhavan. What is Eitzev? What is Eitzev? So Rashi says, first with regards to the man, no, we'll understand how it regards to the woman. Rashi says it means that a person is going to plant um, kidneys, like lagoons. Let's say a person is going to plant an apple tree. But instead of an apple tree, you know what's going to grow? Thorns. That's Itzavon. Itzavon means that you put in a certain amount of effort into something and you say, look, I looked at the field and I understand the field. I'm going to put all this energy in. I'm going to plow the land. I'm going to pull all this energy in. It's going to grow an apple tree. You spend the money, the time, and the effort to grow the apple tree and thorns grow. That's one Itzavon with regards to the male. And we'll understand that it means both. And then with regards to the female, it says, you're going to have a lot of Itzavon. What does Rashi say? What is Itzavon from the name of the marriage? It's it's uh, Tsar Gidl Bonim, the hardship of raising children. But the hardship of raising children doesn't mean what you think, because it's very hard to raise children. It doesn't mean waking up in the middle of the night and feeding them. It doesn't mean supporting them. It doesn't mean all that. It's the same type, the same root letters, right? Eitzev, that is used with the male, is also used with the female. Just like when you plant an apple tree and thorns grow, that's Tsar Gidl Bonim. That's the hardship of raising children. The heart of raising children is that you, you think and you hope that you're doing the right thing and you're trying to do the right thing and you spend all this time and effort and money to invest in your kid to look a certain way and they turn out completely different. And then you say, am I a failure? What went wrong with me? Did I, do I didn't do enough? And, I, and maybe I spent so much money for nothing. I want to give you a very simple example, and you can take this in many, many different levels. You, spend, you take a kid, you think the kid is, art, is, is, is musical, and you, you put them through for 10 years into, into music school, and you schlep them all around the city, and they finally learn how to play a violin, and when they turn 18, they crack the violin, and they don't, open it, they don't touch it again. And you say, what did I do for 10 years? Wasting my time. That's Sargidulban. Sargidulban is you put an effort into something and the result is, is completely something that you don't expect. Now here we have something that's called, it's like a poetic justice here. Because what, is the, what was the problem of Adam and Chava when they ate from the tree? They didn't take responsibility. What does mean responsibility to say that if I do something, there's a consequence? What is the punishment or the effect of that lack of taking responsibility for your life, the effect of that is that you actually don't see a relationship between your action and reaction. The effect is that you can't take responsibility for something. Because I planted an apple tree and now a thorn tree, or th- not a thorn tree, but a th- thorns grew. So I'm putting, into, I'm putting effort into something and I'm not seeing the result. So how could I take responsibility? It's not my doing. You understand? It's, it's because they didn't take responsibility. There's a disconnect between what they do and the results of what they put in the effort to do, to achieve. Is it clear? Now when Noach comes, when Noach is born, when Noach is, is born, which is in chapter 5, verse 29. It says, Vayikash moi Noach. Lamach has a son. I don't think I has him in the page over here. Noach has a son. Here we have the Eitzav, right? You have, because of the tree, uh, curse the ground, the snake, Eitzav. The word Eitzav. When Noach is born, it says, Zayin achmeinu masi yadeinu. This person is going to be, going to bring nechama, going to bring comfort. Rashi says it doesn't mean comfort. It means Noach. It means ease. He's going to ease from our actions. Um itzavon yodenu, the same root. What's itzavon yodenu? So Rashi says he's going to create new, um, new types of um, plows, or new types of ways of to work the land, uh, tools that we're going to able to plant an apple tree and get an apple tree. Now Noach is trying to undo the chet etzadas. This is the reason, primarily, where we're going to read later in Noach is why Noach, the first thing that he does, Noach, the first thing that he does, is he plants a, a vineyard. Right? And why does he plant a vineyard? Because according to some of the sages, the, 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 the fruit that they ate from the, from the tree of knowledge was, was grapes. So therefore Noach is do, trying to do a tikkun for that. He's trying to rectify that action. 
What does it mean he's going to take? He's going to drink responsibly, right? That's the that's the the, the simple way of phrasing this. What happens? He drinks like a like a like a not responsibly, <laughs> very not responsibly. And there's a terrible ending. You know, there's a medrash that says that when Noach was planting the vineyard, it's a funny story. Do we have time for stories? The medrash says that when uh, Noach was planting the vineyard, first they um, a monkey came along. And the monkey says, what are you doing? He says, I'm planting a vineyard. He says, what's a vineyard? A vineyard is, it grows, it grows grapes. Then you make it into wine, you can drink, you can have a good time. He says, I want a part of it. He says, fine, you have to, you have to let a little blood, put a little blood into, into the ground, so you'll, you'll be my partner. A few minutes later, uh, a lion comes along. and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm planting a vineyard. A whole story, what's a vineyard? Wine, I like wine, it's a good idea. Put some blood. Puts a little blood. A few moments later, a pig walks by. Same story. What are you doing? Vineyard, wine. I like wine. Give some blood. So the matter says from that point onward, when a person starts to drink a little wine, first they act like a monkey. Then they become strong like a lion, and eventually they look like a pig. <laughs> so this is the story. That's what happens exactly what happened with, uh, with Nayakh. Now, who names, who names Noyach Noyach, and he says he's going to release us, ease us from Bitzav and Yedenu, who names him his father? How does his father know? How does his father, father gave, has a baby, and he has a child, and he says, this child is going to grow up and he's going to ease the whole story of the Garden of Eden. How does he know that? So some would say, he's a prophet. That's a simple answer. He had prophecy. Some say that he did a calculation because Adam died and it says only in your years so then he figured if Noach was born on the day that he died and the year that he died and Noach was born that he would circumcise. But then there's a, there's a commentary that appears to be from the Zayar. The Zayar says that he actually made a mistake. It was, it was an expectation. Lamech has a child. He's part of the Yitzavan. He's part of the same story. Lamech has a child and says my son is going to be the savior. But every parent says that. My son is going to undo everything that was done into the, the world up until this morning, or my daughter. And I'm going to name the most, the highest name, name Noach. He's going to be like Mashiach. You hope so. That's part of the Yitzavan. Part of the Yitzavan is that you have to believe that it's true and give the effort and the time and your whole koyach and your whole strength to raise a child in that way. But what happens is already their free choice. That's Eitzav. So now the question becomes, how do we wrap this up in two minutes? <laughs> no, the, the question becomes, how do we undo this? If this, the whole idea of, of, the, of the tree of knowledge, the whole idea is the responsibility of Nachash, the idea of Lilith, which is to live without responsibility, that you just live for the pleasure, and I don't take responsibility. So how do I actually undo it? How do we get back into the Garden of Eden? How do we live, like we say, not just like a predator, how do we live in a way that we talked in the beginning that Kitzalmeni Kun was saying that we're connected with the divine image of everything? And the answer is, in very simple words, the answer is that we actually start taking responsibility for everything. That's how we live. That when a person, in the language of the Rambam, in Maimonides, that a person should actually see, always perceive the good and evil in himself and the world as a perfect balance. If he performs, if he performs one good deed, he will tip the scales in favor of the good, and bring redemption for self and the entire world. That's the way you have to look at this world. That your one action will actually change your responsible one action. That you take responsibility will actually change the entire everything. Not just you and your family and your extended family and this. The whole planet, the whole earth, the whole universe, everything will be redeemed because of your one action. And if you say, but I did my one action, it doesn't help, it's not true. What I'm trying to say is like this. Some people say, it's very popular for people to say stories like, you know, you never know who you help. I don't know, there's some famous stories like some guy helped a guy that ended up being the guy that saved his life. And you say like, you know, you never know, you have to do everybody, you have to be kind to everybody because you never know who the, who that, what's going to happen. That's a terrible story. It's a terrible narrative. You know, you know why? Because what it means is that 95% of you are doing favors for people is actually worthless. It's just you never know. Maybe that one time is actually going to help you. And it's completely selfish. Because you're kind to this one person, you end up, you know, 
the, the Churchill's grandfather, he met a guy, they say made penicillin or the, some story. Everyone has some story that you met a random person, you're helping, you help them because that person ended up saving the whole world. Every person is saving the whole world. And every action you do affects the whole world. That's, that's the real way of looking at it. Not, I'm going to do this person a favor even though they look like who knows what. And they don't look like they even have Rahmanas on themselves. They don't even have compassion on themselves. But I'm going to be the kind person. I'm going to help them because you never know. This guy could be a tzaddik, right? That's a famous story. Evi Schlepper is a tzaddik. And this person, you never, you know, one of the 36 hidden tzaddikim. So I'm going to help this person. No, the answer is you have to help the person even if he's not a tzaddik. Even if you know 100% the guy's going to do nothing with his life. That's not relevant. Because every single action you do can affect the entire balance of the cosmos. And that means you take responsibility for everything and you live in a responsible way. It's the opposite of undoing the nachash klipa, of taking responsibility. And taking responsibility goes even deeper, and this is some of the teachings that the Baal Shem Tov taught. The Baal Shem Tov taught that everything that we see in this world is, our, is a mirror. That if we see something in this world, it's a reflection of what's going on within us. So if you see something that's completely not relevant to you, you see the news, I don't know if you, why you would watch the news, but let's say you do, and you see something terrible that happened in this world, you would say, okay, so, okay, that happened over there, what could I do for it, maybe I can do it. It's not only that, but you have to say, what do I have to learn from it? What in my life is related to that type of aggression? What in my life is connected to that type of activity? So everything becomes an opportunity to learn and to grow. And you take responsibility for everything that happens, for everything that you see, everything that you hear, everything, everything, everything you take responsibility for, and you ask yourself, what could you do? And not only if you can physically go help, because sometimes maybe you can't, but there's always something to learn from it. And that's the idea that the world is our mirror. The world is a mirror is that it's reflecting something to us about ourselves. Because if we wouldn't have that within us, we wouldn't see it. You only see what's going on within you. If you don't have this, this, this particular trait, you wouldn't even notice it in another person. They said there were different Hasidic Rebbes, or Bzusha, or Levitz, or Baditcher, and they all had different levels of, of love, of obviously soul. So one, one, um, one loved someone and didn't look at the bad. One, the, 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 the negative of the other person. Another, a, a higher level of a tzaddik is someone that, that, uh, that, uh, the first person didn't look at it. The other person looked at it, but just dismissed it. And the third person didn't even see it. Right? There's a, there's a different way of looking. I can say, okay, this person is... All right, but, I, you know, every person has good qualities, and I'm not going to look at the negative qualities. That's one level. And then there's a higher level, you don't even see it. But if you do see, if you do see the negative in another person, that's because there's something negative within you. So that means that you're taking responsibility. You take responsibility for everything and anyone and everything. And this is the way we go back to the original story of living in the Garden of Eden. That we go back to the Tzalmenu Kid Masenu, and we live in a place that we take responsible actions. We do, we make free choices of Eitz Adas Taivara, because we're constantly making choices, but the choices that we make is from an understanding that we're still within the Tree of Life. The Tree of Life is the Tree of Unity. That there is absolute unity in everything. Everything is interconnected. There's no Eitz Adas, per se. You can't, the moment I say this is not related to something else, this present is not related to the, to, to the past, or not related to the future, or this person is not related to the other, that's when I'm making a Chet Eitz Adas. That's when I'm idol worshipping. Because I'm saying one thing is not connected to the everything. And the, the original is Ketzal Menu, Ketzal we have this understanding, we're created from the everything, we are connected with everything, and we live with that. And this is, this is some of the connections that we have, what is going on in terms of what is the definition of the human being? How do we live fully as a human being? What does it really mean to, to be responsible? And how do we live a spiritual life to understand ourselves back into the Garden of Eden without too much listening to the snake?